of intelligent machines that work and they act like humans. So through this field, we teach computers or machines how to behave like us humans. Now in AI programming, it focuses on three cognitive skills. The first one is the learning process, meaning that it learns to acquire data and, and creates rules for how to turn the data into actionable information. The second skill is the reasoning process. Um, it learns how to choose the right algorithm to reach a desired outcome. And the third skill is self-correction process, meaning it works on continually uh, fine tuning the algorithms and ensuring that they provide the most accurate results possible. Then we move on to machine learning. So machine learning is an application of AI that provides system the ability to learn and improve from experience without being explicitly programmed. So what does that mean? It means that it focuses to extract information from data automatically by computational and statistical methods. So why do we choose machine learning? Well, because of its great practical value in a variety of application domains where it is impractical to manually extract information from the data. There is another, um, or there is a branch of machine learning. It is called deep learning. Deep learning is an AI function and a machine learning technique that teaches computers to learn by example. It mimics the workings of the human brain in processing data for use in detecting objects, recognizing speech, translating languages, and also making decisions. So the main difference between machine learning and deep learning is that as we can see in the figure in machine learning, we need a programmer, someone, a human to do feature extraction. If I give it a bottle, then a bottle of water. So then that programmer would extract the features of that bottle and then machine learning can work on to classify um, those different types of bottles. However, that's not the case in deep learning as it learns on its own how to extract features of the given inputs. Moving on to machine learning examples in our everyday life. Um, the first example is the use of machine learning or AI in commute estimation. For example, in Google Maps, it calculates which is the best route for us and how can we reach to a certain destination. For Uber, for example, using machine learning, it estimates the cost price of the ride, depending on how far or how near the place you want to go to. And also it is used in autopilot, for example, when we, when we used to fly on airplanes before the pandemic. Um, the, the autopilot um, facility is enabled thanks to machine learning and AI. Another example would be an email intelligence. Maybe you have noticed in Gmail, it um, classifies our emails on its own um, as primary inbox, social inbox. For example, we get advertisements from shops we shop from or subscribe to. And uh, sometimes when we want to reply to an email, it suggests phrases or words that we can write, for example, thank you, kind regards, and so on. And it also uh, filters spam emails. Another application would be evaluation and assessment. And this is, of course, for any teacher, any professor, um, you're, you're, of course, uh, using uh, safe assign, for example, or any plagiarism detector, just to see if your student copied um, his project or her project from somewhere else or not. Another application would be, or another use of machine learning uh, every day would be social networking. For example, Instagram, if um, you clicked on an ad, you'll get similar ads, same thing to Facebook, you post a picture, and then it recognizes people in that picture and asks you if you want to tag them. Same thing for Pinterest, as, uh, as soon as you pin a post, then you'll start getting suggestions regarding that post and so on. Another example would be personal smart assistants like um, Siri and Alexa. And also machine learning is used in medical diagnosis and uh, healthcare. In fact, um, deep learning techniques, neural networks, they have been used in order to uh, detect tumors and uh, many other applications in this uh, sector. So coming to the types of machine learning, basically they are, they are three. I'll be talking about two in details and I'll just mention the third one. So the first one is uh, supervised learning. The second is unsupervised learning. 
For the first type, the input and the output data are labeled for the classification to provide a learning basis for future data processing. What do we mean by that? In uh, supervised learning, uh, the term comes from the idea that an algorithm uh, is learning from a training data set, which can be thought of as a teacher. So this training data set, in my case, I will call it meteorites. So the supervised learning technique would know that, this, that, that in this folder, I only have meteorites. There are several, let's say, methodologies or techniques of uh, supervised learning. We have nearest neighbor, naive Bayes theorem, um, neural networks, and decision trees. In our case at the academy, we are using neural networks, as we will see later. So this example or this picture exemplifies or demonstrates how supervised learning is used. So I give it an input of red apples, and then, then it goes through the training data set. The algorithm works on that this is an apple based on the uh, training data itself. For, unsuper for unsupervised learning, sorry, it says connection unstable. For unsupervised learning, the model works on its own to discover information and classify the given data as they are not labeled. In such algorithms, uh, they can be useful in cases where the human expert does not know what to look for in the data. You have a bunch of data and you just want to organize it, but you don't know how. So here is where you, where you use unsupervised learning. Examples of it would be clustering, self-organizing maps, blind signal separation, and anomaly detection. The picture below shows uh, an example. I give it uh, data, apples, banana, and uh, mango or orange. I don't tell it what those fruits are. It knows on its own that the apple is in a category, the banana is in another category, and the orange is or the mango is in another category. How? Based on the similarities. For example, all red samples would be labeled as apple, all yellow ones would be labeled as bananas and so on. So this can be also useful in other um, applications or depending on our needs. There's also reinforcement learning. However, I'll not um, explain that in uh, this talk. Now, in order to understand how machine learning works, um, first of all, we have data collection. For example, we collect pictures of meteorites. In case we want to do image classification, we can collect numbers, we can collect names, any kind of data collection. And then, of course, we have to keep in mind that we need to store that data somewhere um, sometimes PCs are not, uh, or CPUs do not have enough, enough storage. That's why we need to switch to GPU. In any case, then comes the data analysis part. In this part, there is the training data set and validation data set. I'll come to testing set uh, later. For the training and validation, say we have a thousand images. We'll split them into 75 for training, 75%, and 25% for validation. What will I do to those data sets before I feed them into the algorithm, before I start training on them? I have to do something called data augmentation. Data augmentation means, in simple words, editing the picture and making variants of it. I can crop it, rotate it, blur it, uh, increase, decrease the contrast, and so on. So this is what we mean by data augmentation, and this is a crucial step in machine learning uh, in order to have better data sets, of course. And then comes the testing data set. This is when you want to test your model, uh, a new picture or a new data, numbers or text, any kind of data that your model did not see before in order to evaluate your uh, system. Then comes the algorithm development. For the algorithm development, first of all, you need uh, Python. You need to write the algorithms in Python. You can use uh, Python IDLE, you can use uh, MATLAB, any platform that is suitable for the Python programming language. And you need necessary packages, libraries that provide you with those computational powers, such as TensorFlow, Keras, and NumPy. Those are packages that en enable you to add for example, one plus one equals two, how will, how will the algorithm knows that this is an addition operation? Using those libraries and packages, you will be able to do that. After developing the algorithm, 
uh, running it on the training data set, we have something called hyperparameters fine tuning. For example, I tested the model, it's not performing so well. So what can I do? There's nothing I can do in the training data set. It's, it's done already and I'm sure it's very good. So there is a chance of making your model better by tuning the hyperparameters. What do I mean by hyperparameters? For example, let's say there's something called an epoch. Epoch means how many times you want your algorithm to see the data set. I can increase it from 10 epochs to 20 epochs and then see the difference. There are also other um, hyperparameters, but I don't want to go into detail. The idea is there are some values we, which you can play with or change, modify to see which combination gives you the best result. And in machine learning, this is common. It's um, mainly trial and error until you get the model uh, you need. Then you test the algorithm once again. And finally, you draw conclusions and decide if your model is a good one or not. In uh, deep learning, deep learning uh, utilizes, how does it work? It uses neural networks. So uh, neural networks or artificial neural networks, they are again algorithms inspired by the human brain. They learn from large amounts of data. So the way neurons work in our brain, the neurons in deep learning and uh, neural networks use the same methodology to an extent. We have those inputs. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not. Uh, labeled as X1, X2, X3. Those are the neurons which receive the input. They receive the, the images, for example, from the training data set, and then they go to the other layers, uh, layers until they reach the output. And the output, you expect um, the result you want, for example, meteorite or not meteorite. I'll further explain in, uh, in the upcoming slides. So ANNs are intended to replicate the way we humans learn. They consist of input and output layers, as well as hidden layers, the ones in between. Those hidden layers, they consist of the neurons that transform the input into something that the output layer can use. They read the input in pixels, if the input was an image, for example. So this is how they build um, abstract ideas or representations on top of each other until they come up with some, something useful and reasonable. There is another kind of uh, neural networks called convolutional neural networks. They have one or more uh, convolutional units. A convolutional unit is basically a combination of two functions that produce a third function. So it merges multiple sets of information, let's say pixels, uh, pulls them together by pools, let's say average them together to create an accurate representation of an image. The picture here, I believe, demonstrates how it works. For example, this the yellow box here moving, this is a convolutional unit. So it goes over the image three by three. And from each section, it takes the number. So for example, in the first, first iteration, we had four ones. That is why we have the number four here at the beginning. Um, in simple words, convolution is just um, taking representations, the most meaningful representations to build uh, a fuller image later on as it passes through the hidden layers. How do we add convolutional uh, new, uh, layers to our algorithms? This is how we do it. We write model.add, and then we write conv2d because it's two-dimensional. We specify the number of filters. Those filters are um, the main players in extracting features from a given image. It is three by three padding, meaning, meaning it, keeps, it keeps the same size of the image, and then activation uh, this is something uh, that we don't really need to know at the moment. Um, so those filters, this is a convolution layer which has 32 filters as mentioned, uh, each, of, each of which are three by three. This is all to create a meaningful representation of an image. So in machine learning or deep learning, there is um, image classification and object detection. In image classification, it is a technique that is used to classify or predict the class of a specific object in an image. The main goal of this technique is to accurately identify the features in an image. How do you do image classification? Using the algorithms we just mentioned. There are several architectures when it comes to machine learning or deep learning. What do we mean by architectures? The figures you see here. 
For example, we have an architecture called Lynette. This is, I believe, is considered to be the one of the first architectures. This is the architecture. First layer is the input, and then we have a convolutional layer. Then we have a pooling layer, pooling. Again, let's imagine pooling as an average. We have another convolutional layer and other layers. Another architecture is known as AlexNet. They vary in how many layers they have. They vary in the arrangement of those layers, all uh, depending on their um, desired outcome. There is also VGG. There is ResNet, MobileNet, Inception V3, and we have used some of them as we will see later on. There's also uh, something called object detection. Um, object detection is used to determine where objects are located in a given image. So it's not just to classify the image, but to say where that object is. For example, you can see this picture. It um, identifies or determines the, the um, location of the object and says what that object is. For example, in this image, you can see that it detecting where the dog is and it's giving a percentage that this is 80% dog, this is 90% cat, this is 95% rabbit, and so on. There are uh, two main types, RCNN and YOLO. YOLO is the one we are interested in. You only look once architecture. This is how the architecture looks like. We are developing this for um, our meteorite recognition. Um, however, it's, it's, it's still uh, under uh, progress, under work. Now we have learned what machine learning is and deep learning, the differences, how they work. I hope uh, it, it was easy to grasp and understand. Now we will see how those techniques are applied in astronomy. I'll just mention a few uh, examples. The first example is, or the first application is detecting and characterizing interstellar structures. Uh, all of the mentioned uh, projects are uh, recent publications from 2019 and 2020. Uh, to begin with, what is an interstellar medium? It is composed of hydrogen and helium with trace amounts of carbon, oxygen, and other elements. So in order to have an algorithm to understand what an inter interstellar structure is, we need to build a data set. Where do we get our data from? We get it from uh, optical observations, radio observations, and also X-ray. For the optical, there are several ones in this project. Um, the first one is from an uh, American observatory. Uh, and also the second one, it is the Southern H Alpha Sky Survey uh, Atlas. And the picture here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. This shows the observatory, which has those instruments mounted on telescopes. And then we have uh, the Australia Telescope Compact Array. This is the radio uh, that provides this project, the data needed. And then for X-ray, uh, those two are used. Erosita, this is the picture of it. It's basically um, a space uh, observation uh, tel uh, te telescope. So all of these provide the data necessary to build a data set for the machine or for the system to know how to detect and characterize interstellar structures. So for model training, they use a package or a library called Keras. This is uh, essential for machine learning. They use the architecture VGG. If you can recall, we mentioned there's AlexNet, ResNet, VGG. So they used VGG. Um, and uh, what they did is the fine tuning they did in the last layer of the architecture, they changed some parameters in order to fit uh, their needs. So this is an example of the sample pictures they took from all of the mentioned uh, 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 observatories uh, like radio and uh, optical. This is a sample. Um, so what what is this uh, observatory or what is this instrument? It is a product of a wide angle digital imaging survey. Basically, uh, it can uh, detect emission from the warm ionized interstellar, uh, interstellar gas of our uh, galaxy. So they used VGG as mentioned, they kept everything as, uh, as is, but they changed the last layer of the architecture. So instead of a dense layer, a third dense layer, they replaced it with dropout. At the moment, we don't need to understand why and how. The idea is to provide you with an idea of how we can tune or change things to fit our needs. Then for the model testing, 
Um, this is, for example, one of the images captured. And then it was able to detect certain regions which represented, um, for example, hydrogen or the things they were looking for. They did mention that in the further steps they are going to take, they will focus on characterizing the detected structures. Yes, they can detect structures, but they cannot 100% identify it or characterize it yet. And um, they are willing to develop their project in, or, in order to know the origin of the structure. Another example is the maxi mask and maxi track uh, tools for identifying contaminants in astronomical images using CNNs. So, for example, we work on the UAE MMN uh, network uh, project and uh, the images we capture, sometimes they have contaminants, if we, if we can call them contaminants, for example, airplanes, insects, birds. So the same thing in astronomy, the images captured from observatories, from the um, imaging instruments uh, mounted on those observatories, sometimes they capture a lot of noise or undesired contaminants. So this project actually um, contributes in solving those issues. So what did they do? In their data set, they gathered data from uh, using those instruments and they divided their uh, data set into local contaminants and global contaminants. For the local contaminants, it was about 12 classes. So the contaminants were cosmic rays, uh, hot columns, dead pixels, uh, persistent satellite trails, um, fringes, saturated uh, pixels, overscanned pix uh, pixels, and uh, several more. Um, what they did is they got clean images or they tried to clean it as much as possible. And then they used certain tools in order to, to add those contaminants to those pictures, just to train the algorithm how a contaminant looks like on an image. For global contaminants, they were basically tracking errors, which happens when the telescope moves during an exposure. For example, if, if it was windy, if uh, there was an earthquake, this is, this is how a telescope uh, move, moves. So in total, they had around 50,000 images. Of course, all of the mentioned projects, th those data sets, they go through data augmentation and then they, the algorithm is trained on them. Um, this is an example of the contaminants. This, this, the, as you can see from the um, description here, so the top row, the first picture is cosmic ray hits, and then the next one, the one next to it is uh, colored in black. This is the ground truth. Ground truth, let's say it is a mask of what is supposed to be there. And then the second one is an example of uh, hot columns. Uh, uh, and the third one is bad columns. In the bottom row, there are bad lines, persistence, and also satellite trails. There are also additional images of the remaining of the 12 classes, but I have only included this just to provide you with an idea of uh, how things look like. So they had, as we mentioned, two neural networks, one for the local contaminants and one for the global contaminants. For the local one, they used a VGG-like architecture. Again, we see VGG. This is how their architecture looked like. The green boxes, they resemble the convolution, which merges two images and um, into a, th a third one. Um, for the global one, uh, they used a much simpler architecture. Um, it is uh, made of uh, convolutional layers followed by max pooling and fully collected, connected layers. So it is much simpler when compared to the one before. So the input image here, this shows what a uh, tracking error looks like on the image. It does not affect a part of the image, but the whole image. However, in the local contaminants, it only affects certain parts of the image when compared to uh, tracking errors. Um, this is the result after training, what did we get? The first column represents the image that it was uh, the, the image, they gave it an image. And then the second column represents the ground truth of what we expect the algorithm to have like. So in the third column, this is, this is the output. Those are the predictions. So ideally, the predictions on the third column would match the ground truth in the second column. So to an extent, they are matching. But for example, in the second column, if you can notice on the top, the red part next to the long green line 
is more than the one in the third column. So of course, no model can be 100% accurate, but these kinds of uh, accuracy are very uh, useful, especially for uh, detecting contaminants in astronomical images. Another project is meteor detection using deep uh, CNNs. In fact, we are working to something similar to that as well. So their data set, for their data set, they used a monitoring station located in uh, Brazil. Um, they took about 122 images. I think they were divided into 41 meteor, 81 not meteor. And then they took another 20 images from exhaust stations. This is a sample of a meteor image, and this is not meteor. This is probably an airplane. For the model training, they used a six layer neural network um, using transfer learning technique. Transfer learning technique means, uh, we mentioned it implicitly, means changing the first layer of an architecture without uh, changing anything else. Uh, this was also based on a VGG uh, architecture. For the model testing, uh, the first picture resembles a picture which has a meteor. The second one is just a cloudy image. So they, re they reached a conclusion and they saw that without fine tuning, fine tuning of hyperparameters, their accuracy was about 79%. But with fine tuning, it increased to about 84%. So this shows us that the, da the data set along with fine tuning, those are two, two important factors in order to give you the best uh, model. So those, those are the things one needs to work on when building a machine learning or a deep learning system. Um, the previous two projects could play a role in the UAE MMN project. How? As you know, at SAST, we have the Sharjah Tower and then Al Yahar and Liwa, we have the other two towers. So in total, we have three towers in different parts of the country and they observe meteors or anything pass passing by in the UAE sky. Now, every day, um, we receive a huge amount of data from the UAE MMN. And up until now, we filter them manually. This takes a lot of time, um, especially when we have cloudy days because clouds are moving. So cameras detect anything that is moving when we have airplanes. Um, and also when there are insects moving on the camera or if there are birds or, or any, any source of uh, light or anything that is moving. So the three pictures on the top represent examples of meteors. The images below, three images below, represents not meteors. And the third image, um, if we are reading from right, represents a video of a meteor that was captured by one of the stations. So uh, applying the mentioned projects to this network would help us greatly in, um, when it comes to manual um, filtering the data and as well uh, as uh, enha yani enhancing our capabilities in machine learning at the academy. There is another project that I'll briefly talk about. It is machine learning based surrogate model of uh, Mars thermal evolution. The objective of this research is to build a surrogate model that can predict the entire evolution of the 1D temperature profile of Mars like planets. You can leave aside the details regarding Mars and uh, thermal evolution, but understand the idea of how machine learning can be used here. So for their data set, they used the following parameters, reference viscosity, activation energy, activation volume of diffusion creep, um, heat pro uh, producing elements in the crust, initial temperature of the mantle. So those are numbers in um, CSV files. So this is not image classification, they are not images. Using those data, using those numbers, they created about 10,000 evolution simulations of Mars. How does it look like? It looks like this. So the figure of the evolution of the mean mantle and the core mantle boundary, CMB, as you can see in the, in the first uh, row, the core mantle boundary and the mean temperature, um, those simulations are used as the training data set. Why are they used? In order to come up with the last image here, it is the um, temperature profile. This is what we expect um, for our learning uh, algorithm to learn. We, we'll see in a bit. So just to note that uh, from um, the power or the reference uh, heat fluxes 
the colored according to the reference viscosity, they are from high to low, from blue to red, blue being higher and red being lower. For the model training, they used uh, a trained network that can take the inputs we mentioned in the data set. And then for model testing, this is what they got. They, they, comp they compared the evolution results from the trained surrogate model, their own model, and simulations from Gaia, which is a space telescope. The ones from their model is in, dashed, in, in the dashed lines, and the ones from Gaia are the solid lines. So we can see, for example, in the first image, regardless of uh, what it means, uh, the dashed and the solid lines are almost converging and coming together. And this applies for all of the inputs, the one in uh, red, the one in yellow, the one in blue, the one in purple. And same applies to the second image, the mean temperature, and the last image, which is the uh, temperature profile. So we can say that they have used machine learning in order to predict uh, temperature profiles uh, which, which eventually converged in the plots we see here. Another example related uh, to Mars is, was actually conducted by my colleagues here at last, uh, Noor Al-Amir and Ibrahim al -Sat. Um They were in, enrolled in an AI diploma program. So they worked on developing a model to predict the state of the ionosphere on Mars by measuring the electron density rate using AI. So what they did is for the data set, they used those inputs, solar longitude, solar zenith angle, Mars to sun distance, altitude, latitude, and longitude. As you can see, the sample is also uh, using numbers as a trained data set, not images. So it's not limited to that. And for the model training, they have used several algorithms. The best one turns out to be the resilient backpropagation. And we'll see an image here demonstrating the difference between two models. Um, the first image, which has a gray background, this shows the re resilient backpropagation. It, has, it had a regression value of 96%, which is decent. They tried another model, which is the uh, Levenberg model. The regression value was 29%, and it's not coming along the line, or it's not, it's not aligning properly, hence the electron density was not uh, predicted well using that model. However, it was predicted well using the resilient back propagation model. Those two examples of uh, researches or research projects are useful because uh, we are about to receive data from the Hope Probe mission. That is why knowing how to apply machine learning for data related to Mars is very essential. So a similar AI machine learning system can be applied to data coming from the whole prop. This is why such kind of projects are important. When it comes to SAST and what we are working on at the moment, um, we are developing a meteorite hunting algorithm using deep learnings and UAV. The UAV in this, uh, in this case, it, it just carries the computer which has the algorithm in it, and it carries the camera that's compatible with the computer. And of course, uh, we draw the path of the drone in a given area. So the main talk here will be about the algorithm itself and uh, not uh, the drone, as it is just uh, ca a carrier. Um, the images you see here are meteorites collection from the meteorite collection we have at SAST. We developed this project in two phases, or let's say we started with something and then we developed it into something else. For example, in phase one, for the data set for meteorites, we didn't have the collection back then. So we used meteorites from the Encyclopedia of Meteorites. And for not meteorites, it was just collecting search results of rocks, land, and, and uh, desert. For phase two, for the meteorites data set, we used uh, the meteorites from our own um, data set, which we have at SAS. And of course, it went through data augmentation. So the number increased uh, significantly to 100 uh, uh, or 2000. For model training, for phase one, or when we first started, we started using Linet. Linet is the simplest uh, architecture. and um, it was actually what was used to create this whole revolution in the field of machine learning. In any case, we used Linet, we used MobileNet v2, we used Inception v3. All of these are kind of architectures that you have seen in previous slides. And for the deployment, 
we used Raspberry Pi, which is a small um, processor. By Linnet Mobile Net Inception, I mean that those algorithms were deployed on the computer, how the computer is connected, the small computer is connected to a main computer, and then that program, which utilizes those architectures, is, is uh, run on that uh, computer. So then the drones, uh, drone carries the processor with the camera, scans the area, or scans the given um, object, which is, in our case, a meteorite, and then gives us the result. The drawback of phase one was Linet performed, uh, or mobile net v2 was, uh, was best in terms of performance. However, it was heavy for the Raspberry Pi. This is why we had phase two. We replaced our deployment device into NVIDIA Jetson Nano. It is a more powerful small computer, hand-sized computer. In this uh, case, we used also, we, we kept Linet and we used Adelie. Adelie is an architecture developed by a team that is also uh, concerned with looking for meteorites in the desert, hence they developed this architecture and we used it to test it, to evaluate it and to see how well it works with our data set. We also used ResNet and AlexNet. And coming to the results or model testing, for phase one, the accuracy, the best accuracy reached was at 89%. the height of the uh, drone, how, how high the drone was from the object. Again, internet connection. How high the drone was um, high from the object. And for phase two, we had a different uh, way of doing it. First of all, the best accuracy was, was reached at 93%. This was by Adelie, by the team that developed this uh, architecture for looking for uh, meteorites. In the first four images, we see a meteorite placed on the sand. We noticed that all models correctly classified it as meteorite. This is great, but this tells us that there may be overfitting. Overfitting means that even if I, if I showed it something which is not a rock, even it will classify it as meteorite. And this is very normal in machine learning. It happens a lot. This is why we need fi fine tuning and constant refining of the data set whenever possible. The other four pictures uh, is a rock. We took it from outside and we tested it. Lynette thought it's a meteorite, but Adelie said that it is not a meteorite. Alex Nett said also that it is not a meteorite. However, ResNet thought it's a meteorite. So this shows us that Adelie and AlexNet were able to recognize rocks as rocks, not as meteorites. And this, um, in addition to other output uh, results, this led us to say that Adelie performed best, followed by AlexNet and then followed by the other two architectures. There are several other applications of uh, machine learning and astronomy. We have, uh, machine learning applications to classify galaxies, to map galaxies. And also there's a research that is cited as deep learning for the selection of young stellar objects candidate from uh, infrared uh, surveys. The uh, machine learning is also used to classify exoplanet candidates. Um, it is also used to catalog pre-made sequence objects. And uh, there is also another project which is titled as Data Mining in Hubble's Archive to find extra solar systems. So as you can see, the applications of machine learning are a lot and uh, they can almost, machine learning applications in general can serve in any field as long as we have a lot of data and we need help to regulate that data, to categorize it, to deal with it smoothly. This is where machine learning comes in or uh, AI in general. So this was it for today's talk. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, learned a thing or two from it. Thank you very much. If we have questions. Thank you very much, uh, Aisha. This is uh, wonderful. It was a beautiful presentation that uh, you covered uh, many, many aspects of uh, astronomy and the use of uh, machine learning uh, uh, in, this, in this field. So please let me open the... Uh, the floor, do you have any questions, please? You can chat, you can write it down, or you can you can just... Uh... I, I can see a question. Okay, please uh, go ahead. Where the precision, 
by Muhammad Ali were, were the precision and recall of your meteorite detection algorithm different by meteorite type? So stony versus iron. In the first phase, yes, we had stony, iron, Martian, lunar, because it was um, meteorites collected from the internet. In the second phase, yes, we do have those diff different kinds of uh, meteorites in our uh, collection at SAST. However, from the, phase, uh, from the first phase, we learned that the system gets confused a lot when we train it on stony meteorites because, because it looks very similar to terrestrial rocks. So in phase two, we limited our uh, meteorites to mainly iron meteorites. Thank you for your question. I think there is another one. Any suggestions for someone who wants to get in the field? As long as you're interested, you can get into it by watching tutorials, by learning Python, uh, and then you can apply it in, in any field you like. There's another question by Anas. Is it possible for a computer science major to have any sort of internship or research participation in SAS? Yes, um, first of all, um, my major was uh, computer science and uh, we do have interns every summer to do their internship at SAS. So if you joined us, we'll be happy. Um, thank you all for your nice comments. Thank you. Uh, okay, there's a question by Yazan. Is there any reason why we specifically should learn Python and not any other language? Um, learning other languages is good. It's actually how we start to learn Python. They usually teach us C++, Java until we reach Python. But when we compare Python to other languages, it is uh, much simpler, easier to deal with. And today in the field of machine learning, Python is mainly used. I hope that answers your question. There's another question by Muhammad Ali. Was there a correlation between the best filter size of the CNN and the altitude of the drone since both affect the relative size of the detected object in the pixel? So you're asking if there's a correlation between best filter size and altitude. At the moment, I cannot recall. However, I am sure we have um, tried a lot of things, uh, phase one, phase two, when it comes to filters, um, how many convolutional layers, dropout layers and dense layers. So at the moment, I cannot recall if there was a correlation or not. I cannot uh, tell you precisely, but thank you for your question. Thank you all for thanking me. Um, uh, you're welcome everyone. Another question, please. Yes, there is one by Kavia. What do you suggest to do a major for internship at SAS? Is it, uh, sh sure, it is uh, allowed for, uh, internship is uh, allowed for everyone, uh, as long as you are in the UAE. Um, I didn't get the first part of your question, to a major for, what kind of major? If you are, for example, doing mathematics, physics, uh, computer, junior computer science, you can join us. Also, if you are doing uh, other kind of, uh, if you're majoring in something else, it depends on what your major is and how it can help you in your internship here at SAS. How about biomedical engineering? Hmm, at the moment, I'm not sure, but in general, generally speaking, biomedical education, if we are thinking about the future a lot, then maybe yes, somehow it can be related uh, to this field, this is the answer I have. This is what comes to mind at the moment. Machine learning now is being applied to every field, every you can think of. I can, uh, I can intercept and answer this question, uh, not really directly to machine learning, but since uh, many years, uh, they are developing methods to minimize the exposure on uh, x-rays for instance so to minimize in order to minimize exposures in x-rays they use advanced techniques uh, to detect the signal so i think uh, machine learning will soon infiltrate if not already uh, the biomedical imaging in many many aspects but uh, mainly for signal detection not for really uh, classify a disease or something more advanced that you need uh, uh, better, better understanding of the human nature, which is not easily uh, developed in a neural network yet. Okay, any other question, please? 
I see one question. How did you estimate the number of hidden layers and the number of neurons in CNN? Well, to start with machine learning, you usually would take a, um, a, an architecture that is already there with its given number of uh, neurons, given number of hidden layers, and you would apply it to your, to your um, uh, data set. So then you can decide if, you, if there's something you want to increase or decrease. So you don't decide from the beginning, you take what's there. You go to, for example, GitHub, you use uh, AlexNet, and then you try to test it, and then you can modify it. There's another question. Is having a, a background in math and MATLAB useful rather than Python? Yes, definitely. Of course. Any suggestions for open access data sets related to astronomy for practice? I think Dr. Antonius is the best one to ask. Any suggestions for open access data sets related to astronomy? You can help Dr. Antonius. Sorry, it took me a bit of time to find, to, to unmute my, my microphone. Any that for say data sets uh, related to astronomy? Yes, uh, there are. I mean, uh, all the data sets of major observatories are coming public after one or two years of, uh, of data. Uh, what examples you can see is the SDSS uh, Sloan Digital Light Sky Survey uh, that they have a lot of investment on uh, deep, uh, not deep learning, uh, data mining and, uh, and machine learning there. So yes, and Gaia as well uh, uh, from the European Space Agency. Some of these data, but the data release are coming already uh, reduced. Uh, most of these data are already reduced and processed. Uh, but you can see applications and papers on, uh, on advanced techniques on machine learning and AI on, uh, on astronomical applications from the big surveys like slow and digitalized sky survey, uh, Gaia surveys, and uh, the very recent one, uh, Vera Rubin, I think, telescope, which is currently being built. Uh, but you can find white papers explaining what are the plans uh, on, uh, on use of uh, AI in astronomy in big, in big, big surveys. Okay, thank you for your input, Dr. Antonius. Uh, two more questions. Have you considered the use of transfer learning methods in deep learning? Yes, we tried it for um, phase one, if we may call it. We used it uh, for inception. Uh, but again, the issue was that it was uh, a bit heavy for the um, uh, processor, even though it was uh, transfer learning. The other question is, what about open source project that we can involve, that we can get involved in? Mm, I'm not sure, but if you go on GitHub, you'll find some. Uh, I used to uh, use um, uh, um, machine learning tutorials from... Uh, Pi image search, if I remember correctly. I forgot the name of the person who develops it, but recently he closed it. By closed it, I mean it was open access, uh, but now we have to pay or, uh, uh, yeah, we have to pay in order to get access to those uh, tutorials. But I'm pretty sure you'll find many online, especially on GitHub. Okay, thank you very much, Aisha, for this uh, nice talk. So uh, thank you very much for all the uh, people who attended this, uh, uh, this lecture, and hopefully uh, you benefit a lot. Uh, as you know, this lecture is recorded, so you can find our YouTube channel. Uh, so everything is there. All of our activities now are recorded because of the COVID. So whatever you miss, so you can find it. Okay, thank you again for everyone. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, uh, for this lecture, uh, Aisha, and also uh, for the whole academy. So see you next time, see you for the next activity, and it will be posted uh, on our website and also on our newsletters. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Salaamu Alaikum.